Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Thursday, Tuesday, January 29th. People need to know if their aldermen are dirty. <laughs> Salacious new details with reports of sex for official government action and more in the widening corruption scandal that threatens to engulf City Hall. Plus, analysis of the possible legal implications for Alderman Danny Solis and the power brokers he recorded for the government. When the president stays out of the negotiations, we almost always succeed. I'm for whatever works, which means avoiding a shutdown. Congress looks to avoid another shutdown, updating a very busy day on Capitol Hill that does not include the State of the Union. This, it tells a story which is a thousand years old. Gold is at the center of this little-known history of art, commerce, and medieval masterpieces from Africa. And what an Illinois Supreme Court ruling about biometrics privacy could mean for Google, Facebook, and everyone else. And travel through American automotive history with a glimpse at an extraordinary private collection of vintage cars. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. Burr. Paris Schutz has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Paris. That about sums it up, Brandis. I really like the way you delivered that, too. Chicago, according to some forecasts, will be colder tonight and tomorrow than Antarctica, Siberia, Mount Everest, Mars, and just about everywhere in the known universe. As a result, city emergency officials are warning people not to go outside tonight and tomorrow unless they absolutely must. The brutal cold snap is expected to send temperatures overnight and in the early morning to 20 below with wind chill values as much as 55 below zero. Mayor Emanuel and other officials announced expanded warming centers, including five CTA buses to serve as mobile warming centers. Meanwhile, the Department of Buildings warns landlords that they must be providing working heat or else face steep fines and that residents should take fire safety precautions if they're going to be spending a lot of time indoors. Take precautions with space heaters and extension cords. Ensure your smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors are working. And never attempt to use a gas oven or stovetop to heat. Call 311. We will respond. And if you need placement, we will work with the Department of Family and Support Services to make sure that you and your family are safe and warm until your heat is restored. And with the weather warnings, many local institutions are shut down tomorrow. Chicago Public Schools has announced classes are canceled both tomorrow and Thursday. Other government agencies like federal and state courts, state, county, and city government offices are all closed. And early voting at the Loop Super site is canceled tomorrow. Chicago's airports are also reporting hundreds of canceled flights for tomorrow. And you can check our website, wttw.com news, for a list of city warming centers. Chicago police are investigating a possible hate crime and are urging people to call in with tips. This after Fox's Empire actor, Jussie Smollett, was allegedly attacked early this morning in Streeterville. Smollett was reportedly attacked by two men in masks, had racial and homophobic slurs leveled at him, a chemical thrown on him, and a rope tied around his neck. He was treated overnight at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and later discharged. Chicago election operations are vulnerable to an attack or a disaster. That's the conclusion from a report released today by the Chicago Inspector General. The report says the Chicago Board of Elections does not have a contingency plan and could not assure that election operations would be able to go on in the case of an emergency. The report also found millions of dollars in wasteful or unnecessary spending at the Elections Board. That report recommends developing a contingency plan and having information technology inventory that, quote, meets best practices. Early voting in the upcoming municipal election started today, but as we mentioned, will not be on for tomorrow because of the weather. And for the specifics of the weather forecast, cloudy tonight with a low all the way down to minus 21. And cloudy tomorrow night with a high, yes, a high expected of 13 degrees below zero. And don't forget, you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And now, Brandis, back to you.
And thanks, Paris. We'll see you again shortly. The corruption scandal at City Hall just got even seedier. The Chicago Sun-Times is reporting on an affidavit in which the government alleges Alderman Danny Solis exchanged official City Council acts, actions for sex acts, Viagra, campaign contributions, and other favors. The Sun-Times also reports today that among the thousands of conversations recorded when Alderman Solis was wired by the feds, one was with arguably the state's most powerful politician, Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan. Madigan was reportedly recorded attempting to obtain business for his law firm from a developer that Solis had brought, brought to him. Madigan denies any wrong, wrongdoing, but state Republicans blasted what they called, quote, an incredible conflict of interest. Joining us now to talk about what the Sun-Times has learned and reaction to it are Sun-Times reporter Tim Novak and our own Amanda Vinicky. Amanda, good to see you. And Tim, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Thank you. Amanda, let's start with you. Bring us up to date. Well, actually, the Sun-Times began with a story last week that said that Alderman Solis had actually been wearing a wire to record conversations with Alderman Ed Burke, who, as we know, is charged with attempted extortion in a criminal complaint. So there was a lot of feedback at that point in time, people calling for him to step down. Well, he is still an alderman for the 25th Ward, but just this evening, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced that, in fact, Solis has resigned his role as chair of the city zoning committee, and that comes at a crucial time given this upcoming vote on that monster development coming up in Lincoln Yards. So that is certainly significant. And Tim Novak, I want to get to Madigan shortly, but first, Briefly explain, if you would, what the Sun-Times has uncovered so far in relation to Alderman Danny Solis and this growing corruption scandal. We uncovered an affidavit from uh, an FBI uh, investigation of Alderman Solis that began back in the spring of 2014. Um, by the uh, fall of 2014, Alderman Solis began uh, wearing a wire cooperating with the federal uh, agents and they recorded numerous conversations between him and developers, uh, between him and uh, uh, lobbyists seeking uh, work from City Hall, different favors in, in, in exchange the alderman is asking for campaign contributions. Um, one lobbyist for a for Elgin Street Sweeping, the company that uh, street sweeps the expressways. Uh, was looking for a um, break on the city's uh, water bills for uh, taking water out of the hydrants, and their uh, lobbyist was providing the aldermen with Viagra and uh, uh, visits to massage parlors. So bizarre, I've got to say. I mean, aldermen have health insurance. I, I mean, a very serious question there. It's bizarre to me that he needed and, that favor. But he need, well, and Amanda, you've been getting reaction to all this. What's the buzz been at City Hall? Well, so I think some of it is just that, that it, this is pretty astounding. I mean, a campaign contributions people are perhaps used to, but um, in exchange of allegedly, of course, actions at City Hall in return for um, blue pills that he had requested is certainly something that is more rare. As I noted uh, earlier, he is still an alderman, but prior to this coming out and Likely now that w what we have learned, thanks to sometimes reporting, probably because of it, he was not going to be running again for re-election. As a, a, so, you would have the people that are trying to take his place coming out and saying that they want him to step down and resign flat out early. We also did hear from some of the candidates for mayor. They introduced ethics plans. Let's hear from them, and they weighed in. We can't go into an election in four weeks and have this cloud of suspicion way beyond Burke and Solis. People need to know if their aldermen are dirty, if other officials are dirty. Let's bring that to light so that we can clean up city government. This is just more evidence of the, of the pay to play system. And you have to ask yourself, why aren't these people in jail? Why have these people never been indicted? It's because these are the individuals that are writing the laws. These are the individuals that have been enforcing the laws. I mean, at the end of the day, this is how the system works. I mean, people move in and out of government making money. You have elected officials who, uh, who have been in public office for decades, earning money uh, uh, through their firms, uh, profiting from their elected position. So, Tim Novak, how does House Speaker Mike, Mike Madigan fit into all this? He hasn't been charged with anything, correct? 
No, the speaker hasn't been charged with anything, and um, what we've seen in the affidavit, there, there's no indication that the speaker actually has committed any kind of crime. But what happened is in the uh, spring of 14, a uh, developer's consultant was uh, wearing a wire uh, himself, uh, meeting with Danny Solis, uh, who was unaware of the man wearing a wire, uh, regarding a proposed hotel in Chinatown. Uh, Mr. Solis said he would take the developer and the consultant to uh, meet with the speaker whose law firm handles property taxes for hotels and other kinds of properties and that if they hired the speaker the project would go through so uh, Alderman Solis has these meetings with the consultant and the hotel developer with the speaker who doesn't know he's being recorded. Um, the speaker lays out the um, uh, things that his law firm does for people, how much they will charge, 12.5% uh, to $3,000 um, for this contract. He's looking for a long-term uh, arrangement, but the speaker never uh, is a, alleged to have uh, demanded anything in return. Um, and Amanda, how has Speaker Madigan responded? Well, so it's interesting because this story came out is it was the first day of the real legislative session in Springfield. That said, we didn't actually get an appearance from House Speaker Michael Madigan. Rather, we heard instead from him via just a statement in which he said, to my knowledge, I am not under investigation by the office of the U.S. attorney, and I have not been contacted by the U.S. attorney relative to Dan Solis. We also got a statement from Madigan's private attorney, Heather Weyervaught, who echoed that she that there is no indication of an investigation, merely saying the speaker recalls attending several meetings with Alderman Solis over the past five years, including meetings with individuals in need of legal representation. If indeed some of his conversations were being recorded, the speaker did not know that, but he has no concern if they were. The speaker has no recollection of ever suggesting that he would take official action for a private law firm client or potential client. So again, part of this is really not surprising because we have all known for a long time that Madigan is a very successful real estate attorney and he makes no bones about that. He is known for being very, very careful. And again, that is where you hear from his attorney, okay, we invite any sort of recordings because he would not be heard on them making any sort of quid pro quo. Nonetheless, it certainly has people talking. Could this be at a time that Madigan has more Democrats than ever in Springfield and a new Democratic governor that this could be the, the latest uh, chink in his armor? We will. That remains to be seen. We did, however, hear just a bit from Governor J.B. Pritzker, who said he couldn't comment on an ongoing investigation. He had this to say, though, about politicians, outside jobs and accountability. I think it's very important for people to be held accountable if they've done something wrong. We need to make sure that people are either abstaining from the activity on the outside that would interfere with their ability to do their job that they're elected to do and do it ethically, um, or abstaining from being involved in it in any way in government. Tim Novak, what more could we see out of this affidavit? There are other things that we have yet to write about. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics at this point, but there are other things that are contained in the affidavit. Um, um, I will say that the uh, the parts of the affidavit that uh, are related to the Speaker Madigan, we have written about those. Out. We have written about those. Gotcha. But, but certainly, people are very much on pins and needles that there is going to be. More coming. <laughs> There's, you know, the, the affidavit indicates that the federal agents recorded perhaps 20,000 phone calls with Danny Solis, and there's a similar amount of phone calls that they recorded with Alderman Burke. Um, there's, there's a lot of phone calls out there. More to come. Not giving away any scoops, though. <laughs> Tim Novak, Amanda Venicky, thanks for joining us.
Thank you. And Alderman Solis is not running for re-election in the 25th Ward, but if you're interested in learning more about who is running, be sure to check out our Voter's Guide to the Chicago Election. You can learn more about the field of aldermanic hopefuls in all 50 wards, as well as the candidates for mayor, clerk, and treasurer. That's all at WTTW.com slash Voter's Guide. Up next, Paris Schutz with some legal analysis of today's revelations. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. As we've just heard, the information reported by the Sun-Times today came in an application for a search warrant to, uh, targeting veteran 25th Ward Alderman Danny Solis. Here to help explain that affidavit and what its stunning contents could mean for Alderman Solis and House Speaker Mike Mad Madigan are Michael Monaco, a former federal prosecutor now known for his work as a criminal defense attorney, is a partner at Monaco and Spivak. Patrick Cotter, also a former federal prosecutor and a longtime white-collar crime defense attorney at the law firm Greensfelder, and criminal defense attorney Gal Pasetsky of the law firm Pasetsky and Berliner. Welcome back, gentlemen. Uh, first, Gal Pasetsky, what is this legal document that the Sun-Times is basing a lot of its bombshell reporting on? So when a, when a federal agency wants to go and search your house or search your offices or whatever it is, uh, a federal agent authors an affidavit. The affidavit has to lay out information to show a judge that will eventually, they hope, to sign that search warrant to show the judge there's enough probable cause, enough, enough information in there that a crime may have been committed for the judge to sign or put his signature on a search warrant. And Patrick, that's what an affidavit Patrick is. Patrick Cotter, isn't a document like this typically under federal seal? Yes. So what, is, what, is, what do you make of the fact that this has gotten out to the Sun-Times? It's fairly stunning. Uh, I can't explain it. Uh, I don't think the Sun-Times wants to tell anybody, uh, but it is very stunning. These, are, these are secret right. documents. It's, uh, absolutely, but uh, it, this is a secret document. It would not normally be unsealed unless and until there were a federal prosecution and if it were deemed to be uh, something that the defendant was entitled to see. Mike Monaco, what do you make of the contents uh, so that have been it, reported I, on? It probably was not the original affidavit seeking the search warrant because they talk, apparently according to Mr. Novak of the Sun-Times, they talk about how many uh, uh, transitions have already been recorded. So if there were 20,000... You're talking about phone calls. Phone calls recorded. Or intercepts. So every month, once you get, an, uh, once you get an, a uh, search warrant, every month you have to go back to the judge and tell the judge that we have successfully gotten all these phone calls and you have to tell a judge and convince a judge that either a crime has been committed or will be committed. And that, and for that reason, we need to continue this uh, search warrant. So this is, this is possibly one of many search warrants that have been issued in this case. Well, I think the affidavit that the Sun-Times is talking about here is an affidavit that was applied to actually search Solis's home and office. This is not an affidavit to get the wiretaps, the, the, the Title Threes, that what we call Title Threes, which are different, and that's what Mr. Monaco was talking about. Here is the affidavit to go and actually search his home or office, which, by the way, did not happen. Uh, I think they may have searched his home, but not office, which kind of tells us that he got... He, he received information. His attorney at the time maybe approached the FBI or the U.S. Attorney's Office and said, okay, I'm going to cooperate and I'm going to give you, I'm going to consent to give you whatever it is that you're requesting in that affidavit. Patrick Cotter, what do you make of the fact that this investigation against Solis reportedly goes back to 2014 and there are at least 20,000 phone calls or intercepts recorded here? It's a remarkably long and deep investigation. 20,000 intercepts is a lot of intercepts. Uh, we're, we're now into the fifth year, apparently, uh, starting the fifth year of this investigation, at least. So it is, it is unusual. It's not unprecedented, but it's a very long time to be up on one guy. 
and I agree that what probably happened here is that somehow Solis found out about it, uh, the government approached him, uh, and he agreed to cooperate, and that, of course, gave a whole new life to the investigation, and then they, they launched from there, and now Solis is providing information, he's given the mantra to other people, and so this thing has been going on this long, but now, of course, that it's all getting out in the open, uh, I think that the investigation part is pretty much over. Uh, now we'll see what it all adds up to. Mike Monaco, what to, what do you make of some of the allegations in this in, in this affidavit? Well, that's uh, it's interesting. It reminds me a bit of app scam. It sounds like they're finding looking for politicians because in Illinois, politicians can have jobs. It's legal for them to work, and they're entitled to work, and they're entitled to seek business for their work and entitled to seek new clients. And it looks like Solis is bringing either fake potential developers or real developers around to politicians and trying to get them in trouble is what it sounds like. With Mike Madigan, are you referring to? Yes. Is that, is that what it sounds like, Al Pasetsky, that, that he's, he's setting Mike Madigan up? It, it, sound, it certainly sounds something similar to that because there is nothing in that affidavit to show that, Mike, uh, that, that Michael Madigan had any type of an agreement with Solis to do anything illegal. Now, th th this affidavit is 120 pages long, according to what we know. It's a very long affidavit. If you look at Burke's affidavit, it's much shorter. I think there's information here that the government or the agent tried to bombard the judge with to show what he would call probable cause, but it's a lot of, a lot of nothing, possibly. Do, do you see, Patrick Cutter, possible crimes committed in this affidavit? Well... By uh, Danny Solis. Right. First of all, none of us have seen the affidavit. We've seen what the Sun Times has chosen to share with us. So, out of 120 pages of, of it, I've seen maybe five paragraphs. But uh, I want to clarify a couple things. Uh, it, it appears to me, according to the affidavit and the reporting, the recording of Madigan was not done by the government. It was done by an actual contractor or a, a developer who went in on their own and wired up and then turned those recordings over. So I don't know that that was a setup. Uh, I do think that if there are documented instances where Mr. Solis is trading official actions as an alderman in exchange for anything of value, whether it's a, a, a blue pill or whether it's money or whether it's something else or it's campaign contributions or even I will throw some business towards anybody you tell me to Danny and Danny says great I owe a favor to Alderman X so I'm gonna have you pay my debt by throwing some business to Alderman X's private business if any of that happened then there's a crime but we haven't seen that yet there's just not enough known about this affidavit well, one thing we do know is that Solis was in trouble Yes, we Solis definitely know that. Solis was in such trouble that he agreed to do what they call consensual overhears. So he, that's what I'm saying. Explain he, that for us. A consensual overhear is not like a, third, not like a wiretap, like a Title III. With a consensual overhear, the, the government has the right, in Illinois or anywhere in the United States, to ask a person to agree to tape record a conversation with another person or two or three or four or a dozen. And that person wears a wire, a concealed uh, a, a concealed recorder and and records the conversations only he knows about it that is allowable in the United States it's not allowable in Illinois you can't do that in Illinois so it's on so law enforcement doesn't have that ability here but in federal court you're allowed to do that well actually in Illinois you could do it uh, there's an exception to the Illinois statute that says if you believe that you're going to find evidence of a crime uh, it's an exception to the rule that you're otherwise not allowed to. Is there to any evidence here of a crime a on Mike Madigan's part? No, I don't see an evidence of any crime about on Mike Madigan, Madigan's part. And uh, honestly, I don't know from what we saw from the Sun, Sun Times, I, I don't even know if there is evidence that we see that Solis commit, committed a crime. However, we do know that on advice of his counsel, maybe scared him enough to say, okay, it's time to cooperate with the government. Do you think he could still face federal charges? Absolutely. Uh, many cooperators, uh, even after their cooperation, or indeed as a term of their cooperation right from the beginning, they're going to be charged with a crime. Now, whether that's the deal he cut or not, we don't know yet. 
but simply the fact that he's cooperating does not mean that he gets a get out of jail free card. And the fact that we see Danny Solis making this statement on Mike Madigan's behalf saying, you know, you're going to want to go with him for your property taxes, that, that doesn't necessarily indict Madigan, does it? Not at all. Not at all. There's, as, as Gail says, there is no uh, uh, evidence of at all of any agreement that if you do this for me, I'll be able to do this for you. A quid pro quo is what they call it. And, you know, critics say it's unethical to leverage your political office for personal gain, but isn't it also illegal? I mean, Illinois, the, the rules are kind of like the Wild West, and Chicago's even worse. But no, I, 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 I have to disagree. Um, I think Mike's right, uh, and, and reasonable people can differ about whether this is a good idea. But in Illinois, legislators are allowed to have private businesses. They are allowed to go out, as Mike said, pursue business, and there's no rule. There's no law in Illinois that says that you can't pursue business that in some way touches on the same subject matter that you touch as a legislator. So I don't think it is illegal in and of itself that he's doing this. I will say this. What is evidence of a crime is only knowable at the end of the story because a piece of evidence in and of itself may look benign, but if you add it with several other pieces of evidence, it may in fact turn into evidence of a crime. We just don't know at this point. Well, Solis said, and according to the article, Solis said that he, uh, the only thing that the government had a, on him is the fact that he went to these massage parlors. Um, and that's, the, that's what made him decide that, okay, I'm going to start cooperating because that, they got me there. However, if you look at it and you read it carefully, going to a massage parlor and, get it, and getting a happy ending is a misdemeanor in Illinois. It's not even a misdemeanor. He can, you, you, so can, he'd you, keep his pension even if they, yes, had, if they had convicted him. Yes, absolutely. So that, that there was an excuse. I don't know what else they have. And I don't know what his lawyer advised him of, and none of us here know about it. But the use of Oprah Winfrey's old farm, the fact that it was a lobbyist seeking city business, it's not enough there, just, just from what we know. I haven't seen anything yet to suggest to me why Mr. Solis cooperated. I can't imagine any uh, qualified attorney advising him on the basis of what we know about little blue pills and a barbecue and uh... Well, there must yeah, be something else. Exactly, to come. exactly. There's got to be another shoe that's going to drop here. We're going to find out why he actually cooperated and it wasn't because of the massage parlor. Mike Monaco, <laughs> how big do you think this federal investigation that now has ensnared Ed Burke, Danny Solis, and has talked about Mike Madigan, how big could this be? Well, it depends on how many people Mr. Solis has tried to en ensnare in the, in the case. And, and do you could, believe that there might be, be other aldermen he was recording? I, I, it sounds like there are other aldermen. Why not? I mean, uh, you know, Alderman Burke is presumed innocent of any crime. Uh, it is unfortunate that he's in this situation, but people like Alderman Solis looking to, to benefit themselves, it's not unusual for them to try to get other people in trouble. 20,000 phone calls. I'm willing to bet anything that a lot of them are with aldermen, state senators, Congress people, mayors, mayors mayor, well, developers, even, even a mayor, a developer here. So w w there's no doubt, as Mike says, Mr. Solis was working and he was working to benefit himself and, and he talked to a lot of people. I will say, I'm not so sure I'm willing to at this point say he was ensnaring people. Sometimes all you got to do is listen to some people and you get evidence. But uh, there's no question that there's going to be more people in politics and business who are going to be touched by the Solis recordings. But could Solis also go to the federal government and say, hey, look, you want a bigger fish? I'll, I'll help you out getting a bigger fish, even if the government has no previous evidence. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. And you have to remember that a defense to what, uh, to what Solis may have been doing is, is entrapment. If he's calling and he's trying to ensnare and he's trying to call you and get you to do things, you get entrapped. Entrapment is, is a often talked about and rarely successful defense. Uh, yeah. It just isn't. And the other thing that's important to remember that when Mr. Solis walks in, he's not walking into a bunch of people who don't know anything about Chicago and aren't already engaged in investigation. It's not just Solis suggesting names to them. They're going to suggest names to him. They're going to say, do you know this guy? Do you know that guy? Can you get a meeting with that guy? Can you call that guy on the phone and ask about this development? So it's, it is not just Alderman Solis going in there and sort of conducting an orchestra. He is going in and he's saying, you got me. I want to cut a deal. What can I do? And they'll tell him. You know, Mike Monaco, we talk about what's legal and what's illegal. I mean, short of changing 
the laws in Chicago, taking away zoning and permitting and licensing and things like that from aldermen, I mean, how is this ever going to stop? Chicago, I believe, is no worse than any other city in America, okay? We have, we have more aggressive prosecutors here than any other country, in, any other city in America. Uh, we, we've tape recorded governors' homes. You know, you don't see that in many other states. Um, so I think we have a very aggressive uh, prosecutor, and uh, pro politicians have to be careful. I don't but at the same I, time, other cities, zoning, permitting, license, those are administrative functions, right. not, not functions controlled by aldermen. No, it, it, you go to a place like New York City, there's plenty of corruption. And Mike's right, every big city has corruption. Wherever there's human beings, there's going to be corruption. But Chicago is unique in the amount of power and control we give to aldermen, and we have a lot of them right so there's a lot of opportunities there to be exploited I will take issue with the idea that Chicago has uniquely aggressive prosecutors I was prosecutor in Brooklyn we were pretty darn aggressive and I don't I don't take a back you didn't to prosecute any mayors did you no we we prosecuted no. four governors here well that may be you know look I did I didn't gr if I was a farmer and I was in Minnesota I wouldn't grow many oranges if you're in Chicago there's a lot of corrupt politicians so yeah you get a lot of corrupt I politicians. Don't think all more, right there are no more corrupt politicians here than any other state all right here's the philosophical conversation we'll have to uh, continue at another time Mike Monaco Patrick Cotter Gal Pasetsky, thank you all very much and Brandis we go back to you Thanks, Paris. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, the trade of gold and other treasures from Africa and how it influenced medieval Europe and beyond. What an Illinois Supreme Court decision means for the privacy of your biometric data and a glimpse inside a remarkable collection of rare American automobiles that are still humming. But first, President Trump's State of the Union was originally scheduled for tonight, but House Speaker Nancy Pelosi blocked it until the longest government shutdown in history ended. It's now rescheduled for a week from tonight. Here to talk about the State of the Union, the negotiations over border security, and the many goings on at the Capitol is PBS NewsHour correspondent Lisa Desjardins. Lisa, thanks for joining us again. So the State Great of the Union here. was supposed to happen tonight. Uh, after the shutdown ended, Nancy Pelosi extended an invitation to President Trump to do it next week, February 5th. Tonight, so what are you hearing about this? Speech. What kind of future the speech looks like it is all set. They do need at least a week logistically to get a speech going, and they're going to have that amount of time. Uh, the president and his crew are working on their drafts, and it will be an important moment, not just, of course, for traditional reasons, the president laying out his vision, talking to the American people, but because it will fall in the middle of yet another border security negotiation. They have until to fe February 15th to come up with another funding deal or funding runs out for nine government agencies again. So we are really technically still in another game of chicken, um, and, and it will remain to be seen how the president addresses that in his State of the Union speech. And Senator Chuck Schumer, he spoke today with reporters about uh, inviting former gubernatorial candidate in Alabama, Stacey Abrams, to give the Democratic response <coughs> to the president's address. What was her response? Right. I think Abrams, who I believe was a Georgia gubernatorial candidate, is someone who's fascinating choice. She lost that election in Georgia, a very closely watched election by less than 1.5 percentage points to a very conservative Republican. It was hard fought on both sides. Uh, she will be, I believe, the first non-elected official. She does not hold elected office at this moment. Um, African-American woman who will be speaking to the country. And the Democrats are making a clear decision here on a lot of, uh, in a lot of areas. One that Chuck Schumer pointed out today about this choice, he said Stacey Abrams is someone who has spent a lot of time talking about voting rights. He said that is the core to everything else. And it is something she's campaigned on a long time. And she has sued, or she did sue, because she believes that voting rights were withheld and suppressed in her election in Georgia. We know that some polling sites were closed by her opponent, who was then the Secretary of State, now Georgia. And there have been many battles over whether voting rights in, were infringed in that election. So she represents that issues for Democrats in a way that they say they want highlighted next Tuesday night. 
and border security negotiations are supposed to restart tomorrow. What are you hearing with regards to those? What's next for negotiations? Ah, uh, you know, it's funny. It's called a conference committee, and technically there are conference committees every time the House and the Senate both pass a similar bill and they have to work out the differences. But usually these conference committees are just formalities. They don't actually meet. There's not really any big uh, reason to pay a lot of attention to them. This one we're paying a lot of attention to. There are 17 members of Congress who will be on this conference committee to try and work out a border security deal. Now, tomorrow will be mostly a formality. That's when they will go around the table. We'll get opening remarks from most of the members of this conference committee. After that, they probably will go behind closed doors to try and figure out how do they resolve this impasse between President Trump's demand for a border wall, that's the term he's been using lately, versus Democrats' insistence that they will not pay for a border wall. They say they will pay for other border security measures. It's interesting about that committee because the, of the 17 members on it, only one member actually lives in a border district. That's a Democrat from Texas. And most of the members live in the east and in the south. So it's actually sort of disproportionately represented by people who don't live on the southern border. I guess you could argue most Americans don't live on the southern border as well and are concerned about this issue. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see if they are able to come up with a deal that both the president and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi can support. And Lisa, what role has uh, the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, what role will he be playing in this negotiation? That's a fascinating question. There was a time a few weeks ago where he was attempting to have a pivotal role in avoiding the shutdown altogether, in ending the shutdown altogether. But in the final sort of hours of the shutdown, it's not clear that Jared Kushner was the pivotal force that he meant to be. And instead, it seemed like the pressure simply mounted from the outside on President Trump, including uh, some of the TSA delays that I know some of your viewers heard about or experienced on that final Friday of the shutdown. Uh, now, we may learn in future times that Jared Kushner was, was part of the ending, the resol ending the shutdown, but it's not clear that he was at this time. We know he would like that role, so we're going to watch closely to see if he has that role this time around or not. Um, but so far, I have not heard from sources at the Capitol uh, that he is kind of back in the middle of negotiations, but we have a couple of weeks yet. There are many players and many cards to be dealt yet, I think, in these ne this next round of negotiations. And the president has said that there is less than a 50-50 chance that negotiators will reach a deal, deal. Will Republicans allow another shutdown? You know, I think the question is really, will one Republican allow another shutdown? And I think that's the president himself. Most Republicans at the Capitol, and I'd say the vast majority, didn't want this first shutdown, and in fact the entire U.S. Senate voted before the shutdown to try to avoid it. They voted unanimously, including all Republicans. So I think it's really the one Republican, President Trump, who matters the most. There are some conservatives in the House, Freedom Caucus members like Mark Meadows of North Carolina, who uh, pushed for the idea of a shutdown, said now is our one chance to get border security, border wall money. We need to do it. Those voices may still be present. Um, and they may feel that it is actually worth it because they are so concerned about border security to have another shutdown. But I think the one Republican who matters here is the president. And Lisa, before I let you go, is the idea of declaring a national emergency, is that still on the table? Absolutely still on the table. I wouldn't be surprised if we end up with no firm deal on border security and then the president has to decide between calling that national emergency or going to a shutdown. He certainly indicated that he sees both of those things as options. Okay, Lisa Desjardins in D.C. for us. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. And we're back with more right after this. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. There's a shortage of African Americans in STEM because there aren't enough opportunities. ComEd wants to change that. One program at a time, celebrating Black History Month with Solar Spotlight. Building confidence, building bright minds, building the workforce of the future. A new museum show is being called the first of its kind. The cultural power, power of medieval Africa is the subject of the exhibition at the Block Museum of Art on the campus of Northwestern. Before it opened, Chicago Tonight toured the galleries with a special guest from the Smithsonian. VIPs from three continents were on hand at the launch of a showcase of the splendor and influence of medieval West and North Africa. 
The exhibition sheds light on how a trade network across the Sahara brought treasures to Europe and the Middle East and back to Africa. It's called Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, and it'll eventually end up at the Smithsonian Institution. We spoke with the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. This is a very, very special exhibition. And it tells the story of desert cultures in the Sahara in the medieval period. And it's a story which has never quite been told in this way. And if you come here and you look at the quality of the work that you will see, and then just engage with the idea that these are African cultures in the medieval period producing some of the finest art, sculpture that you've probably seen, I think it, it is arresting. One of the rarest objects here is this tiny gold band from the 9th or 10th century. It was excavated in a place called Sigil Massa, what's present day Morocco. At the time, it was the gateway to Trans-Saharan trade. What this story here tells you is of Africa being absolutely at the center of the medieval world, influencing communities, cultures beyond the continent but also being a kind of centrifugal force, drawing in people from all over the region and transforming them with African intellectual ideas. Caravans of Gold includes European works of religious art, decorated with African gold or carved with ivory from the continent. Seeing them from an African context, seeing how African ivories were carved in Southern Europe, seeing how copper that was produced in Southern Europe was then created into some incredible sculpture in Nigeria. Th these stories of how these intellectual practices, these creative practices traversing continents in this period, they are just wonderful to behold. The show was seven years in the making. There are loans from the national collections of Mali, Morocco, and Nigeria that have never been seen in the U.S. Even the smallest objects offer clues to a much bigger story. These fragments are the starting point for understanding this medieval history. They are incredibly rare and important and also at times incredibly humble objects, but they're full of affect because they are all that's left materially of this past time. When we're in the presence of these objects, we're in the presence of the past. This is an exhibition that takes all of the cliches about the Middle Ages, about the history of Africa, about the Middle Ages being a dark time when people really didn't communicate with each other, it turns it all on its head. When you go into museums, you see African art, it's masks, it's totems. And what we learn about Africa usually starts with when the Europeans arrive, and of course the history of slavery. But Africa had an extraordinary past long before we ever set foot on that continent. This exhibition is an opportunity to think to a time well before that, West Africa was at the center of um, a global network, a global economy. I mean, all of these things are I think for me that they are astounding that we know so little about them. Because Africa, this continent with this hugely long historical trajectory, so much to teach us, and yet somehow we don't seem to tap into it. We don't seem to give our kids the opportunity to be inspired by its amazing cultures. And this, it tells a story which is a thousand years old, but a story which still feels resonant. The exhibition, Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, just opened at the Block Museum of Art. The museum is on the campus of Northwestern University in Evanston, and it is free and open to the public. There's more on this on our website. Last week, the Illinois Supreme Court issued a ruling on Rosenbach versus Six Flags, in which the parents of a child sued the theme park for collecting his fingerprints without proper consent. The court ruled unanimously in favor of the parents in this case, which is being regarded as an important test of Illinois' Biometric Information Privacy Act. 
Here to explain the decision and its potential implications beyond the theme park is Justin Kay. He's an attorney with the law firm Drinker Biddle. Thank you so much for joining us, Justin. Happy to be here. Thank you. So first, remind us what BIPA is. Sure. Uh, it's the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, uh, and it regulates the collection, use, and storage of biometric information and biometric identifiers. And so those terms are both specifically defined in the statute, but if you're looking for generally what are we talking about, it's uh, behavioral and physical characteristics that could be measured uh, accurately in order to identify a person. And so what happened in the Rosenbach case? So in Rosenbach, uh, I guess I can break it into sort of three segments. So you have the trial court segment, you have the appellate court segment, and you have the Supreme Court segment. So uh, at the trial court segment, uh, a, it was, there was a complaint was filed two years after uh, a 14 year old boy had gone to Six Flags. He wanted to get a season pass, and as part of the process, he needed to get a, a, a thumb scan. So he went, he his, uh, scanned his thumb, and he came home, he told his mom, uh, and two years later, he filed a lawsuit. And so the, the issue was uh, the Biometric Information Privacy Act requires certain types of disclosures. He didn't get those disclosures, so he filed suit. Uh, Six Flags filed a motion to dismiss in the trial court to say, uh, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't injured. He didn't get the disclosures granted, but uh, so what? So what, what beyond that? How was he harmed? The trial court said, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to let this case go, or we are going to let this case go forward. Um, and so it denied the motion to dismiss. But it, the trial court acknowledged it's a tough question. Uh, and the issue is whether or not you're aggrieved under the statute, very specific legal question. So uh, it said, this is a tough question, sent it to the appellate court. The appellate court disagreed and said, we don't think he was aggrieved because just not getting the disclosures is not enough. And then it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court disagreed with the appellate court. So we're back to the trial court level, um, and, and that's sort of what happened. Okay, and then that means the, the decision ended up being then that he did not have to prove harm necessarily. He didn't have to prove actual harm. And so, again, the, the issue for the Supreme Court was, uh, what does it mean to be aggrieved under the Illinois statute? And uh, is it, it, so the Biometric Information Privacy Act has certain disclosure requirements. He didn't get those, and is, is not getting those disclosure, uh, is that enough? And again, the Supreme Court said, that's enough. What exactly constitutes biometric data? Uh, it, uh, again, it's information that you use to identify someone. So I examples, and y you, know, you used to see this in science fiction movies, but now it's become more commonplace. Scans of your fingers, of your hands, uh, of your face, of different components of, of your eyes. And so those are the physical components. There's also a behavioral component to it. And there's more discussion about that. But um, you know, what, what, what are you walking like? What's your gait? Uh, you know, people have looked at the way Vladimir Putin walks and have said, well, he has, he has a KGB gait because he walks a certain way because he used to carry a gun under his, under his arm. And so those are, that's something you use to try to identify who someone is. Why is this useful or an attractive option for companies to use? So uh, there are a number of reasons that companies want to use biometric information. Uh, security, uh, convenience, uh, entertainment. Uh, so from a security standpoint, you want to be able to identify if someone is who they claim to be. So for example, in the Six Flags case, he had a pass and he also had to provide a thumb scan. And so then you know the person with the pass is the person that should be using the pass. Uh, for you know, for other reasons you might use it, um, entertainment value. Uh, there was a, there was Google has an app, um, and it's not offered in Illinois because of this law. But you could you could scan your face, and you would see whether you match up with uh, with an old piece of art, and so. You can't use that in Illinois, but it's, those are the types of things. And then plain old efficiency. Sometimes it's just a lot faster to, to scan your thumb or you know, your iPhone, you scan your face as opposed to needing a password or a passphrase. What does this verdict mean for businesses? How can it change the way they operate? So uh, it's, it's, it's problematic for businesses because what it means is that a business could be 100% 100 compliant with the other aspects of the law. They could really be following the spirit of the law and yet they're subject to suit and they're subject to massive potential statutory damages. The damages in this case that are available if you don't get one of these disclosures uh, are $1,000 to $5,000 per occurrence. And so if you start to add that up, and a lot of these cases are filed in the employment context, so people are using their thumb to scan in instead of a time clock. So they'll scan in, let them, let them know that they're there. But if you start adding up each and every time that they've scanned in or out, you get you know, many times a day, you multiply that by weeks, years, and employees, and you get billions of dollars of potential exposure. So it's, it's, it's very dangerous for companies, and I think what you're gonna find is companies are gonna be more nervous about using biometric technology in Illinois. 
No, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they call this a victory for privacy. In your opinion, what does this mean or is this good for consumers? I, I don't think it's a real victory for privacy because what we're dealing with here is a technical violation. It's a lack of disclosures. So th the overwhelming majority of these cases, we're not talking about uh, information was compromised. Right, you provide your thumb scan. The allegation is not that this 14-year-old boy's information was stolen or misused. And it's not even that he didn't know they were going to use it because he was providing his thumb scan. It was just that he didn't get the disclosures, and so that, 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 that was enough. And so when the Electronic Frontier Foundation says this is a victory, uh, you know, I, I don't really see it as a victory for consumers. It, it's, you'll see more lawsuits, but I don't think consumers really benefit from it. Facebook and Google, they already have BIPA lawsuits against them. Um, so what does this verdict mean for them? Uh, well, they're, they're currently facing lawsuits. So uh, Facebook has a case going on in the Ninth Circuit Federal Court in California. Uh, it's currently on appeal. There was a, uh, th the real issue with these biometric information privacy cases is what they're filed as class actions. Because then uh, you, you multiply each of those individual interactions with a company and, y and again, you get into billions of dollars. So a, a class was certified against Facebook in California in federal court. That case is now on appeal. One of the arguments Facebook was making was uh, precisely what Six Flags was arguing, is that there was no harm here and that the Illinois statute requires more than that. Now, that argument gets a lot harder to make when you have the Illinois Supreme Court saying we think it means something else. By the same token, because Facebook has a lot of arguments there, many of which are not affected by this, but by the same token, because the potential statutory damage are so massive, I think it strengthens one of Facebook's other arguments, which is that this is potentially unconstitutional, that, that such a sort of a, a hammer delivered to companies for a technical violation where there's no real argument, anyone was hurt, information wasn't compromised, um, that's unconstitutional, that's unfair. Justin Kay, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Randis. And now, Paris, back to you. A West Loop warehouse provides an unassuming facade for a treasure trove of American automotive history. Dozens of antique cars with fascinating pedigrees and unmatched style. Jay Shevsky recently went along for the ride at Chicago Vintage Motor Carriage, home of the Richard H. Driehaus Auto Collection. Here's another look. For someone who spends his days surrounded by a visual feast of automotive beauty, Stephen Murphy is a surprisingly practical guy. People ask me very often about my favorite car in the collection, and I usually answer with whatever starts when it's supposed to start and uh, operates like it should. But Murphy's pragmatism makes sense. He directs the acquisition and restoration of the dazzling Richard H. Driehaus Auto Collection, vintage American cars maintained by the team of antique car specialists at Chicago Vintage Motor Carriage. The team takes on restoration work for other car owners, too, but the Driehaus collection is its crown jewel. Anything that's uh, very stylish, anything that's uh, unique, of course, American-made, um, anything that uh, showcases the best of uh, American automotive design and engineering um, definitely is worthy of our consideration. Most people will never get to see the Driehaus collection in person, at least not all at once. The cars are kept in a private facility and for the most part are only brought out onto the road to be displayed at auto shows around the country. The collection includes many cars with great historic significance. It was a 1948 uh, Tucker sedan uh, manufactured right here on the south side of Chicago on Cicero Avenue. Preston Tucker was uh, an industrialist. They only ended up making 51 cars, almost all by hand, um, and we have number eight. This is a 1933 Pierce Arrow Silver Arrow. Uh, it's a concept car, there was five made, but it's a completely um, advanced car for the time. I mean, there was nothing else like it. Uh, it is believed uh, with a high degree of certainty that this was the car that was uh, shown at the 1933-34 Century of Progress. It also includes some cars whose significance is more, well, decorative. It's a 1954 uh, Kaiser Darren. I mean, it, it ran okay. It's a Henry J underneath, which was a pretty uh, pedestrian uh, sedan. So it, it looks like a million dollars, but it just doesn't really perform as the outward design would suggest. The West Loop facility is part showroom, part museum, with vintage auto ephemera and art lining the walls. It's also part old school auto shop, 
where a small team works thousands of hours to bring the cars back to life. Master mechanic Mark Hooper and his team ensure that each car's performance matches its good looks. Right now I am working on the differential of our 1966 Corvette. So one more clean on the books. Yep. And even though it's Hooper's job to get these cars going, unlike Murphy, Hooper is willing to pick favorites. I love different cars for different things. If I wanted to go fast, I'd get in the 66 Corvette. If I want to go in style, I'll get in the Duesenberg. You know, it's just kind of like different shoes. You have different shoes for different things that you love doing. While the collection is not open to the public, local car enthusiasts do have opportunities to see them out and about. There's a couple of shows, one in Geneva, um, one in Oak Brook Mall that we usually take uh, at least one car to. Uh, they also get shown um, Amelia Island, a series of other shows around the country. If their trophy shelf is any indication, the Chicago Vintage Motor Carriage Team has had more than a few good days at those shows. But for Hooper, any day he gets to work on old cars is a good day. The special job for me is getting to preserve and make these cars work the way that they are supposed to so that people don't forget, one, how nice things were back then. It is a dream job. Uh, <clears throat> This is far better than working uh, in a normal shop. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. And there's more on our website, including a gallery of photos. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing and join us tomorrow night live at 7. As fresh ethics scandals envelop City Hall, we talk with Inspector General Joe Ferguson about cleaning up Chicago politics. And a growing trend in Chicago's food scene, adding a surcharge to customer checks to help pay for employee health insurance. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, serving Chicago as a personal injury law firm since 1984.